much on each of them, so I think that they're we're going to manage to do quite a lot in it. So we'll uh, just start off with the first one, Appendix A. And what we're going to start looking at then is how a uh, ROV is structured so that uh, all of the components uh, basically of uh, that you are most likely to find in an ROV. Uh, so we'll start off with this one where we have, uh, we'll start off at the top here. So in the middle on the top, so both there and there, we have the lifting points. So this is uh, the point where the main structure, the framework of the ROV is connected to the lifting wire. So this is what's this is what's holding all of the weight of the ROV once it's out of out of the water and lifted off of deck. And then also up top here we have this yellow part, which is the buoyancy elements, which have a very low density but a large volume, so that once you lower it down into the ocean, it's going to create quite a lot of buoyant force uh, upwards, so that you can can uh, counteract the weight of of the ROV while you're in water. And Usually, uh, the buoyancy elements are uh, painted yellow, some kind of yellow color. Uh, that's uh, what you will usually see, but I've also seen them painted red, and I've also seen them uh, uh, painted in a grayish color. So, so that it depends a bit, but most of them tend to use, uh, use a yellow uh, for it. It has uh, a little bit to do with, uh, with the contrast. So that when you're underwater and you might be looking at a, uh, a black and white screen on your camera, uh, so, so uh, then you I it's easier to pick up yellow colors. And that's why also most of the structures that they put down uh, subsea of the, uh, both the uh, valve trees and, and all of the protective structures and everything is usually yellow. Uh, in fact, uh, so long as you're building a system uh, uh, according to, to the NORSOC standards, there is uh, quite a specific kind of yellow. You have uh, a color code of yellow that you have to use. Uh, and that's actually a, I can't remember the code exactly, but it's in a system that's called RAL. And then you have four letters behind it, which gives you the, the uh, color code. And that's actually given for uh, both the orange color that you use for, uh, for ROV handles, so places where the ROV is allowed to grip, with its manipulators, those uh, have uh, their own RAL code that needs to be uh, needs to be uh, a specific kind of orange, and it's the same for the structures. They need a specific kind of uh, of yellow, and then you have uh, sort of uh, not uh, j just temporary uh, structures that you put down, such as the, uh, the large guide posts that you put down. They have a uh, it's called a white color, but it looks more like a grayish white, sort of a, a the sort of dusty white color, uh, so it's uh, that also has a, a RAL code. So, so there, there is quite quite a few of these things that are, are set that you have to use these colors when you're working with it. And I know that many of the ROV companies they just use the the same code uh, of yellow that's used for for structures. They use that one for for the buoyancy, uh, just to uh, basically just make the ROV show better uh, when it's uh, underwater. <coughs> Uh, then we have, if we move a bit further down here, uh, we got in the front, we've got manipulators. And on this particular one, we've got a seven function on one side and a five function on the other side. And you probably remember a bit when we talked about manipulators earlier, where the, the functions are basically the degrees of movement that it can have. So, so that uh, a shoulder joint, that will be one function. So that uh, the shoulder joint will be all the way uh, inside by the, the ROV there, uh, that will be one function. And then you have an elbow joint, which will give you another function on the arm. And then you have a wrist joint, and the wrist joint can usually move in uh, two directions like this, but it can also rotate. So that then you suddenly have several functions on, on the wrist joint. And then of course you have the, the uh, claw itself on the end, which also has a function. So. It, uh, the, the number just signifies how many functions you have. So the seven function manipulator is the closest that you usually get to, to um, uh, the, the arm of a diver to do stuff. The only thing you're missing is the finger dexterity. So to have an opposable thumb and four fingers to, to work with. So that, that's the thing you're missing uh, in it. But other than that, you're getting all of the uh, movements that, that a diver can do with his arm. 
uh, while the five function one, then you could sort of uh, figure that you so you have a stiff wrist joint, so you, you can use your arm, but you can't really use your wrist uh, to do anything. So you can grab a hold of stuff and move it, but you can't can't really uh, position it properly. And the the five function one is usually mostly used just to keep in position when, when the seven function manipulator is doing its work rotating valves or, or uh, tightening and loosening bolts or moving objects or something like that, the, the five function one will just uh, grab a hold of the structure and just uh, keep itself steady there. Because if it doesn't grab a hold with a five function one, then the only thing that's going to steady the entire ROV are the thrusters in different places. And uh, the problem is as soon as you start exerting some force with this seven function uh, uh, manipulator, then you're basically going to start rotating the ROV also. So if you try to if you try to rotate a valve, you're going to rotate the ROV itself in the opposite direction of uh, what the valve is supposed to go. Uh, and then maybe if you do full throttle uh, on your uh, thrusters, you might manage to pull pull yourself back and actually rotate the the valve. But uh, the best thing is just to grab hold with the other arm. Uh, so that's why the work uh, ROVs always have two arms because they need need to uh, grab hold of something. It's a small observation ROV that just uses uh, the manipulators to sort of brush away a little bit of dust or, or uh, move small objects away uh, in order to, to get to see uh, an area. Uh, that one usually has just a very small uh, with just two or three functions on the manipulators. So it's basically just has a claw that it can grab hold of and then it's more or less going to use the thrusters to, uh, to move stuff around. So uh, it's quite quite a bit uh, different from uh, from what the work ROVs have. <coughs> then we get down to the bottom uh, on uh, this particular slide, at least, where we have uh, uh, it's called a skid here, and yeah, they usually call uh, call the bottom part here a skid, but that's also where you where you uh, connect uh, what you also call a skid, <laughs> which is a which is a framework where you can have have uh, extra. Uh, equipment, special equipment uh, for a, a particular job. <coughs> so we talked about that with uh, with regards to to how much uh, you could lift in in the lifting points and how much extra weight you can load onto your ROV, and then you're going to load it on on the underside of the ROV, basically. So the ROV is going to be placed on top of uh, the the extra equipment that you're going to uh, to lift with it. <coughs> yes. It is possible to, you're thinking about the, the claw, claw tip so that you can change it. Yeah. It is possible to change it, but usually uh, the difference is that um, you have uh, one where the most usual one to use, it's going to be difficult to draw in. The most usual one to use is that you have basically two claws at the bottom, and then you have one claw in the middle that's going to go in between those two. So, so the ba basically you have like, you have a thumb and then you have two fingers and you're going to grip it. There are also some where you have four, uh, uh, four fingers so that you will have two fingers on each side and they're going to, to either, go, either go oppositely like this or they're going to go like this in, in the middle. So, so it depends a bit uh, what kind of uh, uh, work you're going to do. But that's one of the reasons why you, you can't really get the, the finger feeling of, of, uh, of a diver w when you're down there. Bec because you're, you're basically operating a claw. So, so you're just clamping down on something with a claw. And you don't have any pressure sensors in them either. So you don't really know how hard I it's pressing. Uh, so, so that's why all of, the, um, all of the stuff where the ROV is allowed to grab is to be marked in this orange color. Because then it's easy to see. And then also the uh, ROV pilot will know that even though he pushes on with full hyd hydraulic force on the claw there, he's not going to destroy what it is he's holding on to. So that's one example, if, if it was a thin pipe that was there and it was uh, painted yellow and he would grab onto it, he might actually uh, crumple the pipe if, if he uh, put on full force. But if it was painted, uh, painted with uh, orange, uh, then someone had done the calculation that a regular manipulated claw won't be able to damage this one. So, so that's the main difference. But but you can exchange them for di different tasks, but usually 
uh, they just use the claws to hold on to uh, different kinds of handles. Uh, and then they're using a separate tool to do that. For an example, when they're tightening and loosening bolts, they will have a separate tool for it, which we are going to look at in, uh, in one of the uh, other appendixes, actually, just to, to see how that works. So then if we, we strip away most of the stuff that we have here, if we strip all of it away, and we're looking at just the, the framework of it, then it's going to be a bit easier to, to see how it works. So we have the core frame up top here, where most of the internal structure is, uh, is um, connected. And this is also where these sort of bars that are going across it here, that's where the buoyancy elements are, are connected also. So you get, get everything uh, stuck onto this one, and you will have uh, the lifting point will be connected to, to the middle of the framework. And then you have a bottom frame with the skid on it. And the skid usually has uh, the black part here. That's usually just a, a rubber uh, coating that, that's on it, just so that if you put it down on the deck, it's not going to start sliding back and forth because it's steel on steel. You have actual rubber there and that's underneath it. And the bottom frame is uh, holding most of the uh, most of the structure for, for the bottom there. And also you can see here they've put in the uh, connection points for heavy modules. So if you're going to connect something heavy to the underside here, they will be connected to these, uh, these four points uh, below the uh, ROV. So for the next one, <coughs> we have uh, put on the thrusters of it, so we're, we're still, we still have more or less a full stripped frame, but the thrusters have been placed in now. So we have two thrusters that are uh, pointed more or less vertically. As you can see, they are pointed at an angle slightly, and then you have one in the middle of the back there, which is also pointed vertically. Uh, that one is pointed directly vertically, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Uh, these two are pointed a little bit at an angle, which means that if you run one of them uh, slightly uh, faster than the other one, then you're still going to move downwards, but you're also going to tilt your ROV. So it's uh, just a way of, <coughs> instead of actually moving the, uh, the thruster back and forth, you can just uh, regulate the, the, the velocity that, uh, or basically the thrust that it's giving. <coughs> uh, and then you're going to get uh, different effects from it. And then you have one in the middle here which is basically for moving the entire RV sideways. So that's the main purpose of that one. And then we have four in the back. So one hidden uh, in the back there, and then we have three more there. And those are just for propulsion. So that's just to run it forwards. <coughs> so whether or not you're, uh, if, you, if you're going to, to turn it like you would turn a car, if you uh, rotate the wheel of a car, you're going to turn the car like this. Uh, then you would regulate one side of the thrusters that we you would regulate it to either go faster or slower. And then you're going to turn the entire ROV because then you don't have an equilibrium between the two sides of, of the thrusters there. Just in the same way as you would tilt it if you if you make sure that these run uh, uh, don't run with the same amount of force. <coughs> and if you want it to to uh, to be tipping forwards or tipping backwards. Uh, then you would regulate the uh, thruster that you have in the middle there, pointing vertically. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can can uh, manipulate these, um, and everything there is mostly hooked up to the the joystick. So, so to the ROV pilot, it feels much more like uh, flying uh, a helicopter that than than actually basically driving a, a, an ROV on the water, because even though you're in water, you do still have the same degrees of freedom as in a helicopter. You can go up and you can go down, you can rotate in all directions, and you can go backwards and forwards and to the sides. So, so it's pretty different from, uh, from uh, driving a regular vehicle or, or, or running a regular boat, which is locked to, to one, one plane. Because here you have, have three planes of movement where you, you can move in, and then you also have rotations uh, around all of those. So that's called six degrees of movement when, you're, when you have that, because you have, you have uh, X, Y, and Z axis where you can move along. So that's three degrees of movement. But you can also rotate around each of those axes. So then you get six more degrees of movement. So you have uh, three more degrees of movement. So you have six in all. 
And that's actually also what a surface vessel has when it's moving with the waves, because then uh, the surface vessel, uh, surface vessel will also be moving up and down and it will be rotating and tilting. <coughs> so that you get sort of the same effect there, but it's still locked to the surface of the ocean. You can't really, uh, it's not you that's controlling the up and down movement or anything, it's the waves that's controlling it. But with the ROV, you are controlling it yourself. So it's a, it's a bit different from, uh, from uh, other experiences. But if, em if anyone's tried flying a drone that you can uh, buy like a thousand Norwegian kroners in, in, uh, in the shops there, they're fairly cheap. I think you can actually get them down to uh, just a couple of hundred kroners, so fairly small of them. Looks like a helicopter with uh, several uh, rotors on them. Uh, so if you ever tried flying one of those, it's basically more or less the same control system as you would use for, for a, uh, for a uh, ROV. Just with the ROV, you've got something that's pretty much larger and heavier, so that you need uh, more, more force when you're moving it around. But this, uh, this is just a general layout. It might look quite different. Uh, I know um, there's one uh, work ROV that's called, uh, called uh, Constructor which has, instead of having these two pointed vertically, uh, they're pointed horizontally instead, so that they're, they're pointed like this instead. And then it becomes really easy to rotate um, the, uh, the ROV, and also to propel it, they will just shoot it out to the sides here, and then they will propel it forwards. Um, and then they got the same in the back. Uh, so so th there's uh, quite a few different ways of, of placing these thrusters and getting the same effect from it. But this one, which has four thrusters in the back for propulsion, it's going to be uh, be fairly good at moving forwards. So this might be the framework for for uh, an inspection ROV or, or a or a survey ROV. It's a bit too blocky, uh, uh, in my imagination, to be a survey ROV. It should be a bit more sleeker, uh, looking a bit more like a fish, basically, to get the higher higher velocity in water. But uh, it could be could be used for, for something that's going to move uh, fairly quickly forwards. Then we'll put on a couple of more components on it. Uh, so we'll start off uh, at the top here. So here we have compensators uh, in the middle. So we have three compensators, and those are hydraulic compensators. So they are exposed on one side to the ocean, uh, uh, the, the water of the ocean so that they're getting the hydrostatic pressure pushing in on one side, and they're basically just compressing, uh, trying to compress uh, the hydraulic fluid. So they are <coughs> making sure that the hydraulic system inside the ROV has the same base uh, pressure as the surrounding hydrostatic pressure, which means that instead of, instead of having the uh, pump on the ROV having to pump up to 500 bars and then past that in order to have something happen because you have 500 bars uh, surrounding you in the, in the ocean, uh, the, the pump basically starts at 500 bars. So that's going to be the, the zero line for the pump. So, so uh, relatively for the pump, zero bars for the pump, that's going to be 500 bars in, in, in actual uh, pressure. But then the pump is going to start to work and it's going to build up pressure past those 500 bars. So it makes it for for a uh, easier easier construction of hydraulic systems because considering that you have 500 bars on the outside, you have 500 bars on the inside as the uh, as the base pressure. That means that nothing is going to collapse. If if you have 500 bars on the outside and you have a hose, then the hose is constructed to to handle a certain amount of pressure on the inside not on the outside. So it's if it's getting 500 bars on the outside, you, you risk that it's going to just collapse and turn flat. And no matter how you, you try to start up your system again, it's not going to expand again because it, it stays that way once it's uh, been, been uh, compressed. So by getting the compensators to, to uh, sort of reset your zero bar pressure to, to uh, the same amount of pressure as it's in the in the water where you are, uh, at, at the depth where you are, then you, you it's uh, much easier to, to design your hydraulic system because you can use more regular components. So even though you need to use, um, at least hopefully, uh, get a hold of stainless steel components so that they won't corrode as quickly, 
since you're in, in uh, exposed to the, to the uh, seawater, uh, you can still use components that haven't been especially designed to have a very high external pressure. You can use uh, the ones, same type of designs that you're using on land. So it's a, it's a very good thing to have those uh, compensators in there. And then it uh, also has a reservoir for the hydraulics, which is basically just uh, a tank. Um, and I think it depends a bit on how how the ROV is uh, is uh, constructed, but sometimes the reservoir itself is also a compensator. So, so that it, it depends a bit on uh, what kind of company has made it and everything. Um, and here we have some uh, control units for the thrusters. So they will be controlling the flow to the thrusters because the thrusters are run with hydraulics, especially in a, a work ROV. Because they need a certain uh, amount of torque uh, to be able to deliver that. And if you were going to deliver that amount of torque with uh, electrical energy, you would need quite a lot of electrical energy uh, to be delivered to the ROV, which isn't a problem anymore with the current technology that we have. It is fully possible, but, but uh, the industry is sort of stuck in the rough with having hydraulics running everything. It is uh, fully possible to create everything with electrics uh, right now, but um, they're still using quite a lot of hydraulics in most cases. So they have flow control uh, to the different thrusters, uh, and that's going to basically tell them when they're sending electrical signals down to speed up this thr thruster, it's going to get more flow uh, from the uh, hydraulic system. <coughs> then we have a valve pack set up here, uh, and here we need those uh, those very compact valve packs where they have cartridges that they're inserting into one one block of uh, steel, basically, where they've, they've drilled in holes to have different pathways, and they are inserting cartridges uh, with valves in into it so that they get all of the valve functions in one or two blocks uh, inside there. So they get it really compressed uh, in uh, with regards to the size. So it's one valve pack on this side, and once you flip it around, you get one uh, valve pack on the other side. Uh, you can still see the compensators in the middle here. It also has a high pressure filter uh, in connection with the reservoirs. And there is also a low pressure filter on the reservoir. Uh, because this, the, the hydraulic system that we're looking at now, that's just running the thrusters. So this is a clean system. So they have uh, uh, two filters on it. They're trying to keep keep the hydraulic fluid as clean as possible, uh, especially because the motors running the thrusters, they can be quite sensitive to contamination. So you really don't want to get any particles in your, in your uh, hydraulic fluid uh, for that one. And then you have the pump itself uh, in the middle here. <coughs> so we'll move on to the next slide here, which is basically a uh, very complex hydraulics uh, schematic but this is yeah what what did you say yeah the valve packs on it and they're the same kind that we talked about in the hydraulics where you use a manifold so, so you have one block of steel where you are putting in uh, cartridges so instead of having each valve separately and and placing them beside each other, you have a block of steel and you're putting cartridges into the block of steel. So th the cartridges are usually, uh, they, they, they look more or less like uh, just a threaded rod with uh, loads of uh, movable parts on it. And then when you screw it in, it's going to act like, uh, uh, it, it, it is basically the valve, but you have to screw it into to the manifold in order to get it to function because the ports are the holes that have been drilled inside the manifold. That's uh, that's going to be the ports of the of the uh, valve. So it's a very uh, very uh, complex, uh, ver very compact system once you start using it. But it's also very expensive compared to to using just individual valves wh when you're setting it up. Um, so so for ROVs you really want it as compact as possible. So then you're using the solution even though it costs a bit more. So here we can look a bit at uh, the. Uh, schematic for the hydraulics. So 
bit difficult for me to read from this slide, so I'm just going to consult my notes here. <coughs> we have the reservoir at, uh, at the bottom, which is as it's supposed to be. The reservoir will be the equivalent of uh, a tank in a regular hydraulic system. So uh, we usually always put the tank at the bottom of the uh, schematic. And in this case, they have the low pressure filter is placed up here. So that's for the return, uh, the return line into, into the reservoir. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's a filter, but it also has a bypass check valve. So if you get too much uh, flow and pressure on this side, to, uh, so that the, the filter is basically blocking some of the flow, you're, you're getting too much coming back, then the check valve is going to open up and allow some flow to, to go past without passing through the filter, just until the, the pressure uh, regulates itself. Then we have the pump module here. So these uh, black dashed lines, they're basically showing the outline of the pump. So all of the different symbols that are inside here, those are physically inside the pump. So, so that they're not uh, separate uh, components uh, on the outside, they, they are built into the pump. The same goes for the thruster control units. They also have these black dashed lines. So all of this is built into, uh, into that control unit. But we'll look uh, a bit more at the pump first. So we've got uh, the pump itself. Uh, let's see. Um, the pump itself is down here. It's a bit difficult to see up on the big screen, so you'll probably have to, to check down on your or on your papers. Uh, and then we have. Uh, I think it is a. That one is probably uh, a small compensator for the leakage line, so that you won't get uh, you won't get too high of a pressure in in the uh, leakage line uh, of the pump. Uh, and here you have some uh, regulators for for uh, for the pressures of it, <coughs> and they can yeah they can change directions uh, basically. So those are shunting valves, so they are made for switching the directions of, uh, of, of the flow from the pipe, uh, from the pump. Uh, and here you have the uh, high pressure filter that's placed right outside the pump. So right after the pump, it's going straight through a, uh, a uh, high pressure filter. But you can see the high pressure filter has also been equipped with a check valve, which will allow flow to pass, bypass uh, the filter if, if you get too much uh, much of a blocking uh, from the filter. Uh, then we enter into the thruster control unit, and here we have pretty complex system with loads of smaller valves, uh, directional control valves, and here you have the hydraulic uh, motors, I think it is, put it in here. Now these are, no, th there's the uh, thrusters themselves are on the outside here. So those are the hydraulic motors that are running the, uh, the thrusters themselves. And up here we have directional control uh, valves. And these are, let's see if we can interpret it correctly. They seem to be, those are pilot uh, valves. So they, they are giving pilot pressure uh, to control the directional control valves. So uh, that means that the directional control valves here they are basically too large to have direct uh, uh, direct actuation, so they need need pilot pressure to, uh, to be actuated. We're going to get more into that in, in the next few lectures in hydraulics also, so we're, we're going to look uh, more at how how this works. Uh, but that, that's the point with those uh, up there. And you have the hydraulic motors here, and those, as you can see, all of those are connected to a compensator, and that's because uh, in the motor, I'm just going to, I'm not sure if, uh, if they're using uh, gear motors or not, but I'm just going to draw one. Um, so probably not gear motors. Um, mm -mm. I'm going to draw that one. The motor is usually shaped more like a block. And 
and then it has the shaft coming out. So the shaft is the one that's rotating. And then you've got some probably some ports up top here or on the sides or something where you're getting hydraulics glued in. So the hydraulic motor itself is located in here. So that's where everything is, is happening. But as we know from, uh, from uh, when we looked at hydraulic motors and hydraulic pumps, you do get, you have to have leakage because that's the whole, uh, whole only way of getting lubrication uh, to your movable parts here. And you really do need the lubrication or else it's going to stall completely. And the leakage oil usually ends up in a, a compartment down here. And then it goes off uh, in a leakage port and then back to, back to the reservoir. But the thing is, in this compartment, it is in direct contact with the ceiling rings along the shaft. And uh, as we've looked at already, when you have a leakage oil, you don't really get a high pressure here. You get a very low pressure because you don't really have that much oil uh, wandering through here. You have just a little bit of oil, uh, and the whole point here is just to catch everything of it and send it uh, uh, through the leakage line. But then if you have, just to continue on what we did earlier, 500 bars of hydrostatic pressure on the outside here, and you basically have no pressure in here with, uh, with this leakage oil, the 500 bars, they're just going to implode the ceiling ring straight into the uh, motor. And then you're go, uh, going to get loads of uh, water flow into your system. So that's why <coughs> they have this separate compensator. So they have one compensator just for this purpose. And it is connected to, to this leakage area on, on all of the uh, thrusters. So that you have, you're resetting the pressure on those also to get, get the pressure to, uh, to start off at 500 bars and then you have leakage oil coming in here raising it to maybe a couple of bars more maybe five or six bars extra so you get 505 bars maybe going through the leakage line but still the the pressure in your reservoir is also 500 bars so that's not a problem so you, you have a, a minimum pressure on your entire system that's 500 bars it's not going to be a problem at all but you really need to have have that minimum pressure also inside the, uh, the leakage line uh, in order to avoid collapse of it. Um, and then you, we go a bit further here. We have the valve pack up here. Look at that one. And it also has a separate compensator. Because also in, in the valves you're going to have leakage lines and you, you want to, to compensate those also. And you can see it's a pretty, pretty intense looking at the different symbols there. It's sort of a problem also because the, the symbols are really small, so they could have uh, done it with a, uh, they could have blown them up a bit more to make them easy to read. But if you, if you really look closely, it's the, uh, it's the basic directional control symbols that we've been looking at uh, in, in the hydraulic systems right now. They're just very small, so they're a bit difficult to see. Uh, so they're, they look to be, they are four ports and they are three ways. So they are four three-way valves placed up here. And then you have different kinds of shunting valves and uh, pressure valves uh, regulating the system also. Um <coughs> that being said, I know that most newer uh, work ROVs that are created, they usually use something called proportional valves or servo valves uh, instead of regular directional control. Uh, and the, uh, the proportional and servo valves, they are a bit different because they don't, uh, instead of having like these have, they have three switching positions and four ports. And you are either in that position, in that position, or in that position. That's, that's the effect you have. And then you might, depending on what overlap you have, you might have some transitional effects when you are switching between them. But that's basically the three positions that you have to choose from. That's, that's the effect that you're going to get from this valve. The, the proportional and, and servo valves work a bit differently because they, they make sure to have a, a sort of continuous flow uh, between the different, uh, different functions of the valve. 
but we are, uh, we are getting those in, in a later chapter in, in the hydraulics uh, system, so we are going to look at, at those also. <coughs> so I'll, I'll tie it back into the ROVs when we, we get that, that far in, uh, in the hydraulics. Then we're going to look at the, uh, the uh, compensator. No, the reservoir is this one. But as you can see, th this one uh, uh, is also built as a compensator. So instead of having a separate compensator for the reservoir, they've just built the entire reservoir as a compensator. And we can see that because we have the holes in the end here, which are open to, to uh, the seawater. So the seawater comes in here, and the seawater is going to push on this surface as a piston. And in order to help it a bit, uh, we have a spring also to add some pressure which means that most likely the reservoir isn't going to be at 500 bars, but the spring might actually put it at, for example, 510 bars or something, so that you are actually giving your, your base pressure a bit more than the hydrostatic pressure on the outside, which can be a, be a smart thing to, to try to avoid the collapse of hoses and, and stuff like that. Uh, so this is basically a piston connected to uh, or separating the hydraulic fluid on this side and the ocean water on, on this side. And depending on how much fluid you need to use inside your system, this uh, piston is going to be moving back and forth. So if, if, you, are, uh, uh, if you have quite a lot of uh, cylinders in your system and you extend all of them, you're suddenly pumping a lot of your fluid into your system and into your cylinders and it's going to stay there, which means you have less fluid in, in your reservoir. That means that the piston is going to move uh, quite a lot closer to, to this edge, just by the force of the spring and also the, uh, the, uh, the uh, water pressure on the outside. But it's going to maintain uh, the, the base pressure in the system because of this. And then once you retract all of your cylinders and you're suddenly getting loads of fluid back into your reservoir, then the fluid is being pushed in here and it's going to push against uh, the piston spring and, and also the uh, seawater and it's going to move the piston back out. So it's uh, the basic way of how they work. But just to, uh, to make sure that uh, your, your operators, uh, have uh, the, the ROV pilots know that they have enough, uh, enough hydraulic fluid to do what they're uh, thinking about doing, uh, there is also a volume sensor in here. So it's making sure that you don't, uh, don't run low on, on hydraulic fluid. Uh, so, so it's looking at how much hydraulic fluid you have left in your reservoir. And then you have an electric connector here, which goes to the, the uh, volume sensor, just to, to uh, give you signals on how much volume you have. <coughs> I think we're going to try to put down this blind here. We'll do a break also.
try this. Is it easier to, to see the screen now? Or? Yeah. Right, um, we looked at the hydraulics uh, schematic uh, for the thruster system, so, so the clean system, uh, before the break. Uh, so now we'll look at uh, putting in a bit more components in it. Uh, we'll start off uh, up here, so this is the back of the ROV. Uh, and there's a uh, power transformer, so it's going to transform the electrical energy coming from, uh, from the surface vessel being supplied into the ROV, and it's going to transform it into the correct voltage and, and everything to, to, uh, to be delivered to the different components. Uh, and here is a termination box for the electrics. We also have the electrical motor in here, and that's the one that's running the hydraulics pump. So that one is being supplied with electrical energy, running it, and it's converting it through the pump into hydraulic energy. <coughs> and here we also see that they've put in, uh, they've just called it a pressure bottle. Uh, I've mostly heard it being referred to as an, an electronics bottle, uh, which basically means that it is, it is uh, a pressure bottle, much like the one you would use to, to keep gas uh, for your stove or something, or, or your barbecue or whatever it is. Uh, or may maybe even uh, in the workshop to do do, uh, do cutting and, and welding and stuff like that. So, so it's basically just a pressure bottle. So, so the, the terminology is correct there. But instead of having gas as the only thing inside this one, you also have all of your electronics. And you usually have either nitrogen or CO2 as, uh, as the gas inside it. I think most companies use nitrogen when, when they are filling them, but uh, I know that there are a couple that use CO2 uh, for it. Um <coughs> yeah, uh, and uh, I inside the pressure bottle, you have regular atmospheric pressure, so, so uh, the bottle has to be designed to be able to withstand the pressure at the depth where you're going down to. So if you're going down to, uh, going down to uh, 3,000 meters, you need to be able to withstand the pressure there. So it's, <coughs> uh, it's one of the main reasons why we have depth ratings uh, on the ROVs, so, so that some ROVs are only uh, designed to, uh, to be able to work down to around 500 meters maybe. Some are only uh, are designed to work down all the way down to 3,000 or maybe even, uh, even deeper than that. But, but the main reason is that anywhere that you need a pressure vessel like this one, either to have uh, all of the uh, el electronics inside or maybe uh, the camera module for the camera itself uh, uh, in order to, to be able to see where you're, uh, where you're going and everything. And, and also the electronics for, for lights uh, in order to get, uh, get the proper lighting when you're deep enough. All of that needs to be, uh, have a uh, depth rating uh, down to your working depth. So, so that all of it has to be able to, to withstand uh, the pressure at that depth. But, um, because considering that we have the compensator on the hydraulic system and everything, then the pressure at the depth uh, you're working at won't really be a problem for your hydraulics and everything like that. It's, it's wherever you have uh, one bar atmosphere inside, uh, inside something, that's, that's the components that are liable to be broken by, by the pressure. Uh, and now they've also put on lights on the front here. So um, they are usually LED lights, but they are usually also really powerful compared to what you get, uh, uh, what you're able to buy in the stores here for, for use on land. For use on land, you can get LED lights that are usually roughly the same as the old uh, glow bulbs uh, that we had. Uh, but uh, these ones are quite a lot more powerful usually, so often in the magnitude of uh, five to ten times uh, what you would get uh, on land. And then it of course depends a bit on the size of, of the lamp, uh, how much light it's going to give, but considering that when you get below 100 meters there is no more daylight to help you, uh, then you need to bring all of your light with you, and light doesn't travel as far in water as it does uh, in air, so, so that you need really powerful lights to be able to, to see. And also, it's been set up that they have some uh, sensors in the middle here, so that can be 
that can be anything from uh, depth sensors to, to sonar, anything like that. So, so uh, all of these kinds of equipment that they're using uh, will be placed uh, in different locations usually. Here we can see the pressure bottle. So they've opened up uh, a pressure bottle. <coughs> so the pressure bottle itself ends here and it goes up here and then you have uh, the ending here. This part uh, is for connecting uh, wires to it. Uh, so the wires will be coming in here and they will be connected through, uh, through uh, uh, sealing uh, ports there so that the ports will be sealed against the pressure and they will be, uh, will be basically the, the first point of failure uh, if you go to a uh, go too deep with, with your uh, vessel. So it's the, it's the sealing on your, your uh, electrical connections that's going to, uh, to uh, most likely fail first. So before, before you start getting uh, um, basically just crushing uh, the bottle itself, uh, water is going to penetrate in through the, the same way as the, uh, the cables are going. Um <coughs> Uh, the way this one has been built up is that they have uh, a, a sliding frame here, so they can slide it out, so that they can put in all of the all of the uh, electronics boards inside. So this is basically a computer. So, so it's the same same setup as as uh, any computer. You have different kinds of uh, boards uh, going in, and each board has its own own uh, task to do. So, so it has uh, specific things to do. <coughs> Just like I in a computer, you have a motherboard that is doing the, the main main tasks, and then you will have processing and, and everything. Uh, maybe in a, uh, in a regular computer, you have a graphics board also. So you probably won't have a graphics board uh, on this one. There's no need for it. You don't have a monitor with you down there. Uh, but those kinds of boards are usually called uh, Euro cards uh, because they have a special uh, spe uh, special dimensions. So they're going to fit into these racks very easily. So you can just slide them in. Uh, and then it also has fiber supply and uh, fiber optics. And then all the way at the end here, there is the end cap. So that when you slide this one back in, the end cap will be sitting in the opening here. And it will basically be blocking the opening and it will have sealing uh, along it. So it will have, for example, O-rings uh, on the end cap. So I can just do a quick sketch here of it. So if, we, if we've got the bottle going in here and the connections over in this end, and then we're sliding the racks with, uh, with the cards in here, then the end cap, let's see if I make this one a bit thicker so that we can see the walls of the, of the bottle. So the end cap will most likely be fitting inside here. And it will have O-rings going around. And usually you have two sets uh, of O-rings. So you will have a, a double layer of sealing uh, on them. Um, <coughs> uh, the O-ring will, of course, be, uh, be uh, rated for the pressure that it's going to be, uh, be getting. But the reason for using two O-rings on it instead of one is basically that if one of the O-rings gets damaged, if the first O-ring is damaged, uh, then once, uh, once you uh, do your next service on this electronics bottle, once you pull it apart and uh, going to go through uh, all of the electronics, watch the, uh, just to check that everything is okay, you will see that there will be moisture between the O-rings. So that then you know, okay, I have to exchange uh, these O-rings because they, they are about to break now. Because they do get, they do, uh, do lose some of their properties as they age. So they need to be, uh, be replaced uh, every now and then. Uh, and they can also be damaged when, when, you're, uh, when you're putting it in and everything. So having the two of them uh, makes that the moisture will be trapped between them in instead of going all the way in and damaging your electronics. So that instead of having, uh, getting to the point where shit, something's not working in here, uh, we, we really need to do a, an, an emergency service on this one, then you can e uh, instead discover it in your planned service that there are one of the ceiling uh, rings isn't working as it's supposed to, so we will exchange both of them to be on the safe side. So that's a very, 
very nice principle to use when you're working with the electronics. And the same goes for, for camera housings, uh, when you're creating camera housings, for instance. Even though none of the suppliers really uh, say that you should use two, two barriers uh, in there, so because the O-ring suppliers are, of course, saying, well, our O-rings are perfect. They, they, they will work no matter what. Uh, so, and if they don't work, then it's uh, then you've used it in an incorrect manner. So, it's not our uh, not our fault. Uh, but <coughs> just giving yourself this opportunity, especially considering if this is equipment that's going down to three thousand meters, it's probably going to to take uh, thirty or forty minutes just lowering the ROV down. And then when you're down there, you started working, and then something goes wrong because you get uh, get moisture into your into your electronics. Then you have to pull it back up again. You have to fix this. Maybe some of the electronics uh, circuits got fried, so you have to exchange those also. Maybe you didn't have replacement parts for uh, that, so, so you have to get it flown in with helicopter. And then when you're done fixing it, then you have 30 to 40 minutes of lowering the ROV down again before you can continue work. That's uh, c considering that. Uh, a typical uh, a typical day rate for uh, an RV vessel is is uh, easily uh, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you, you really don't want to waste a full working day just messing around with with something like that. So it's very nice to have have uh, a double uh, double layer there just to be on the safe side. <coughs> Uh, the next one is uh, an electronics uh, schematic. So here we have in in the main part here in in the middle that's the uh, that's the buckle itself, basically just show, showing uh, what what it can be connected to. So inside here you have all of the uh, control uh, electronics that will will uh, uh, help you control everything, and you can see that you will have the. Uh, um uh, termination box uh, connected here, and then the motor going to the uh, to the pump. So it says hydraulic motor there, but that's a bit uh, that's a bit uh, confusing. Basically, it's the electric motor that is running the hydraulic pump. Uh, it means so. But that's being controlled uh, through the control bottle. So you got a fiber cable going between between those. You've also got uh, uh, cables going to the hydraulic valve packs because they are solenoid valves. So you need you need the uh, electronic signals to be running all of your valves in the uh, in the uh, hydraulics. And also you need to get signals from volume sensors in your hydraulics, and also uh, running your manipulators and motion sensors and uh, sonars and depths and everything like that. Um, then we have more stuff being uh, connected over here, and here you have like more specialized equipment. So more for the the survey ROVs and inspection ROVs and stuff like that. You have uh, multi beam echolocators, uh, cameras, uh, lasers, uh, even more cameras, sonars. Uh, the the bathy stuff is is uh, bathymetry. I think it is uh, called. Uh, it's uh, basically mapping the, the ocean floor. So it's a very, a very difficult word to pronounce uh, and everything. It lo looks very easy when you see it, but it's uh, fairly difficult. Uh, altimeter, just to get the, the height of the, uh, um, uh, of the uh, ROV uh, in the relation to the ocean floor uh, directly. So one thing is to know the depth uh, with, uh, w from the surface, but also to know the height with regards to the ocean floor, to know that if you suddenly have uh, a height of uh, 20 centimeters, you know that you're in danger of actually crashing into the uh, into the ocean floor. So especially if, if uh, your view is uh, obscured in some manner. For an example, if you are indeed flying that low, you will probably be uh, probably be uh, pushing up a lot of uh, dust particles and stuff, so that you can't really see where you're moving. So then it's good to have uh, have uh, have this stuff uh, and Doppler scanners. Pipe trackers, if you're running uh, pipeline surveys, uh, gyroscopes uh, or gyro compasses, and different survey sensors. There, so there's quite a lot of a lot of stuff that can be connected, and not necessarily all of this will be available on on every ROV because if it's a regular work ROV, it definitely won't need the pipe trackers and all of this, so that that equipment won't be on. 
Then you have something that everyone would have, is the lights and also the camera functions. And as you can see here, you actually have four connections. So in this case, that means we, ha we have four cameras on, on this ROV. And I've heard of a couple of ROVs that they actually had uh, up to six cameras. So, so they would have basically a main camera right in front looking at what the manipulators are doing. But then you would also have cameras uh, over on the sides so that you could get a s sort of a side view on, on what the manipulator was uh, performing. Just three cameras there. Then you would also have a couple of cameras in the back just to see that you were not running into anything if you were moving backwards, um, just to keep, keep, a, keep a view on everything. And then also I think the sixth camera was a movable one. So it was basically like in a cupola on top so that you could, you could move around and just get an overview of everything that was going around, uh, around the ROV. But it depends a bit on uh, exactly how many they have. So th that's up to, up to the designers of that particular ROV uh, to decide how much is needed. And often cameras and stuff like that, they, it can be added afterwards. So, so if they feel the need on a particular ROV that, uh, uh, and, and, and it's not in, they don't feel the need to change the design to several cameras, but, but they just feel that this particular ROV is going to need a couple of extra cameras. Then they can go to, for example, Emenko who will produce cameras and they can get more cameras and they can uh, just modify that particular ROV to have several cameras uh, for sure. So it's not really a problem in, in, uh, in rebuilding. Uh, stuff like this. Then we have uh, the Constructor uh, ROV, which is uh, made by Chus Design, uh, which is a, a Hoogesund company. Uh, and this is actually uh, down here by, uh, uh, by the docks in the town. So they're, they're just doing a test out in, uh, out in Smeasunna. Uh, just checking that everything is working. So that's the TMS up top there, and there you have the work ROV itself. So they're just testing to see that everything is uh, working okay. So now they've moved it off uh, and just testing it. There you can get a quick view of how huge these really are, and, and this isn't really one of the largest ones either, so, so you can get even larger than that one. Looks like we, oh no, it was the last one. All right. <coughs> then we have uh, the next appendix, appendix B. We're going to look a little bit at at the um, the hydrodynamic forces we can uh, we can get. So, if we are considering that this is um, This part here will be the ROV, and then we have the surface vessel up top here, and this will be the surface of the ocean. Uh, then we will have quite a lot of different forces working on it. So we have the, the lifting wire with the umbilical cable, and it will be, this is of course a simplified view because this would of course slope somewhat. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a straight line. It would be more of a, a curved line uh, like that. Um, so this is a simplified view of of how it's uh, going to be. But you will have forces on, on the cable itself, and you will have the weight of the cable, and you will have forces on the uh, ROV or the object that you have down uh, at the end there, and you will also have the weight, weight of it. So if it's an ROV, the, the weight won't really be a problem because there won't be much weight in it, but if it is, uh, if it is a large module that you're li lifting down, the weight will of course uh, be uh, be, be uh, quite a large contributor to, uh, to the forces working on this one. And this is just to show a bit that depending on the ocean currents that you're going to have in, in the area where you're operating, just lowering something straight down probably won't be possible. Because even though you place your vessel directly above whatever it is, your, your wherever it is you're going to place uh, your modules, the ocean currents working all the way down to, to the ocean floor is going to pull on, on uh, this and it's going to create 
this angle between it. And that's something that usually they have fairly good uh, have a fairly good idea of how large that pull is going to be uh, by looking at at uh, meteorological data uh, at ocean currents and also by having measurements uh, being done up by the surface vessel just looking at at, uh, yeah. at the different uh, directions of currents and, and the strength of, of the currents uh, and then they actually need to try to, to uh, quickly uh, estimate how big is this angle going to be and then they actually have to move the surface vessel away from the area where they are actually going to place the part because when they start lowering it down it's going to be moved by the ocean current into into the correct area anyway <coughs> so this is just a little bit to, uh, to, uh, to look at that um, <coughs> If you know the, the uh, force of the ocean current working on the object, so FDB uh, in this case, then you can add half of the force uh, working on the cable to it, and uh, you can do divide it by the weight, and then you're going to get uh, the, the uh, tangential uh, um, function of the, uh, the angle in this case. So of course, if you do the uh, arcus tangens uh, over here to, to, to figure out what the angle is, you are going to get uh, the exact angle. So this is uh, one way of uh, figuring out how it works, exactly how much, uh, how much uh, force you get from, from current uh, and stuff like that. It is highly dependent on like the, the cross-section of the, ca uh, the cable that you're lifting with, the, uh, the lifting wire and, and the umbilical cable. Because how thick is it? That's going to uh, have quite an impact on how much force you're getting on it. Because that's regular drag force, basically. It's just the ocean pushing past it, and it's going to pull it along with it. So it's it's the same way we, we calculated drag in in uh, the last lecture uh, in figuring out how this works. The the problem there is basically just figuring out the uh, the area that you're you're putting it across. So you have to have the cross-sectional area of the of the uh, cable and then you need the length of the cable to look at it <coughs> and the reason they're using half here uh, it has a little bit to do with with the fact that it's going going to be uh, be uh, in a curve and not in a straight line uh, so, so that's that's just a way of simplifying it uh, by, by doing it this way and then of course you have the, the weights will be known so, so the weights won't be a real problem uh, in the calculation but it's the drag forces that's going to be a problem so so really need to know the speed of of the water in uh, the velocity of the water in in your uh, ocean current in order to be able to calculate this but you have the drag force on the object itself and on the cable and then you uh, put in also the weights of them and then you can can calculate the angle and then in the in the compendium here you, ha you have um, uh, more complex ways of calculating it, uh, but we're not going to go into those in detail. It, ju it just mentions it briefly that there are more complex ways of doing it. Uh, and I think it was uh, sort of uh, pointless in uh, putting it in here. Uh, what it does is basically doing, it does this part in, in, the, in the same manner, but for the cable, it, so, uh, it puts in a summation uh, of, of the forces working. So, so instead you'll be looking at the forces in different areas uh, of the cable uh, and you will be summing up uh, the forces instead. So, so um, this is much easier to, to uh, handle, uh, at least on, on, the, uh, on the area of knowledge that we're putting ourselves on in this course. So it's, uh, we don't need to make it overly complicated. Uh, yep, that was everything for that small uh, appendix. So then we're going to start looking at different kinds of uh, ROVs, just some examples of them. So here we have a V8, which is a, a observation ROV. And you can see in uh, it's not all that good of a quality on the uh, on the uh, copies here, but um, we'll do the best we can. 
So there's quite a lot of information uh, in these uh, data sheets. So these are just data sheets that have been gotten directly from the uh, manufacturers of them. <coughs> so this one has uh, three translation axes, forward, backward, sideways, up and down, and it has roll, pitch, and heading uh, in 360 degrees. So it has six uh, degrees of freedom. So it can roll in three directions, and it can, uh, it can rotate in three directions, and it can move in three directions. So that's usual to, to just put in. Uh, I don't think you'll ever find any ROV that doesn't have, <laughs> have those movement capabilities. That would be very strange uh, in any case, uh, not utilizing everything. Um, yeah, th it has some uh, new 360 control stuff, uh, which doesn't really tell us that much, but uh, they're uh, really putting it out there uh, on this one. And uh, it has a small size, which, which means that it also has good accessibility, which means it's going to be easy for it to get into nooks and crannies in structures to, to actually observe if there are any damages or anything. And uh, it also looks a bit at the technology uh, that it uses. It's basically saying that it's uh, cutting edge <laughs> uh, stuff that they're using. So it's, uh, b it's supposed to be used for inspection and observation and search and survey for it. So here we have a depth rating for this one. So it says 500 MSW. MSW is meters of seawater. So it means that it is it is rated down to 500 meters of seawater in, uh, in that depth. Uh, I think the reason why they do it like this, the MSW, is just to, to make a point of that this is in seawater, because seawater has a different density from, from uh, uh, freshwater. So if you put this one in, uh, this ROV into, into a freshwater lake and you run it down to, to 500 meters, you would actually be able to put it even deeper. And, and still be within the same depth rating because you're in freshwater and not, uh, not seawater uh, in that case. It says a little bit about how much power it needs. Weight in air, so it's 70 kilograms in air. So it's uh, still too, uh, too large and heavy for, uh, for one person to, uh, to move it around. You really do need to, to have uh, some sort of uh, uh, handling uh, equipment to, uh, to move it. And it's 75 centimeters long, 65 centimeters wide, and 50 centimeters tall. So it's a fairly large, uh, large observation uh, one. But uh, considering that it's uh, able to go down to 500 meters uh, depth, then uh, I think the, the size is uh, fair enough. And here we have quite a lot more information. So I'll just look at the, uh, that was the performance one. Yeah, this one gives the speeds in knots, so forwards, three knots, two knots, and uh, two knots backwards, vertical, and lateral. It also tells a bit about what kinds of uh, thrusters it has, both for forwards, backwards, and laterals, and also for, for vertical, so going up and down. It tells a bit about uh, functions that it have. So it has auto heading, which means that the, the pilot can, uh, can basically put it on autopilot, so it's going to run in the, the correct, uh, correct heading. So you can just set continue on on this course, and it's going to continue on that course. It doesn't have uh, auto altitude, uh, so it can't be set to, uh, to fly at uh, a certain distance over the ocean floor, so it can't sort of follow the ocean floor in, in height. Uh, but it does have auto depth there, it says yes. So that means that it can stay at, for an example, 400 meters depth. Then it's going to stay at 400 meters depth. So, so then uh, it's, it's just taking, um, taking into account the distance up to the, the uh, ocean uh, surface, uh, not down to the bottom. Uh, the difference is that if you have a survey, if you're going to run a survey uh, along a pipeline, you really want the, the auto altitude one. B because then you want to be able to say like, well, in order to get uh, good readings on my cameras uh, on this pipeline, I need to be 1.7 meters above it. And then you can put auto altitude on 1.7 meters, and the ROV is going to just follow uh, all the dips and curves in, in, in the ocean floor. It's going to follow it. It's going to be 1.7 meters uh, between, between the ROV and the pipeline uh, along, along the entire path. While with the auto depth one, it's just going to stay at 
a certain depth. So if you set it at 300 meters depth, it's just going to stay at that depth. So that's just going to be a horizontal plane going through all of the water, basically. <coughs> Which is fair enough uh, when, it's a, uh, when it's an observation ROV. So, so um, uh, it, it doesn't really need the auto uh, altitude uh, setting. Uh, and it has a gyro stabilized heading. And uh, gyroscopes, those are, um, are uh, or gyro compasses. Uh, they are uh, a bit different from, from the regular ones that uh, you've probably seen in your entire lives, the magnetic ones, which show you the direction to the magnetic North Pole. But the magnetic North Pole is somewhere above uh, Canada, Greenland. So it's, it's not actually on the North Pole. It's, it's fairly close to the North Pole, but it's not actually on the North Pole. And using magnetic compasses uh, is a very... Uh, very, very difficult to, to do if you have steel structures around you B because the steel is going to interfere with the uh, magnetic fields of the earth uh, so that your arrow your arrow showing you the direction is going to basically be jumping around suddenly pointing to, to one of the structures and then maybe to one of the other structures and then maybe actually to the North Pole so you never really know what is your correct heading when you use the, the magnetic compasses but the, the gyro ones it is basically uh, disks, uh, so you have uh, disks that are being uh, spun at a very high rotation speed, so like a couple of thousand uh, rotations per minute, uh, maybe even uh, a lot more than that. And the more speed you get when you're rotating a disk, and then the more it's going to stabilize itself. So it's going to stabilize itself in accordance with gravity and the Earth's rotation. So since the Earth is rotating, it's going to stabilize itself pointing north to south. If, if you have it uh, in, in the vertical axis uh, when you start spinning it, it's going to stay in the vertical axis. So, so whatever is around it, you can start tilting it, but that uh, the gyroscope is still going to stay vertical. And if you have a, a horizontal one, it's going to stay horizontal when, when you're moving it around. And this is actually used on... Um, on like uh, hangar aircraft, uh, so, uh, so aircraft hangars, uh, where they have the, these ships, these huge ships where they are flying off the uh, fighter jets and everything. Uh, they are actually using these gyroscopes, so they have huge gyroscopes uh, inside the center of the, uh, of the ship. And they uh, have spinning disks in the middle, and then the rest of the, the housing around the disks is moving around, and then it's uh, basically just reading off the angles that it's getting in relation to, to the spinning disk. And then it's sending off this information to, to gigantic hydraulic uh, cylinders that are basically uh, tilting the entire uh, deck of the ship where the planes are going to land. Which means that even though the ship is moving through waves and having quite a lot of motion, then the deck where the, the planes are going to land is going to stay steady because it's constantly being compensated with these uh, hydraulic cylinders which are being controlled by the gyroscope uh, and keeping it uh, horizontal. And you can use the same for, for, for ROVs, just in a, uh, on a very much smaller scale. Uh, and it's going to uh, then be able for, uh, to tell the pilot that, for an example, now you're at a 30 degree angle. It doesn't look that way because you're in the middle of the ocean. You don't have any holding points, so you don't really know. You can't really see anything to tell you that you're, you're uh, flipped over on the side but then you have the gyroscope telling you that you are actually flipped over on the side. So, so then you can, uh, you can put it on the c uh, correct side up, uh, so rotate it back. And it's the same thing for, for airplanes. They also use gyroscopes like this to tell them, like if, if they get a spin on their airplane or anything, uh, then it's going to be sort of impossible to actually, actually look at the horizon and see where you're going to go. So then you have a gyroscope instead that's telling you exactly where, where you need to go. Um, <coughs> it has a couple of more uh, functions here, so it can have um, it can have uh, a payload of up to ten kilograms. So basically, it has a small it has a small manipulator up front there, uh, and it means that it can carry uh, something that weighs up to ten kilograms with it. So, uh, so for an example, uh, a small tool with a brush uh, or something to to clean off uh, areas it's going to inspect. Uh, and on the surface, uh, it has a launch and recovery system, uh, and it it doesn't have a specific one because it can be interfaced to to different kinds 
as it says there. Uh, so, so basically you can, uh, you can use the launch and recovery system of another ROV to launch this one without uh, much problems. And it has the umbilical winch, of course a control container, it needs that one, and it also has a workshop container if, if you need to do some work on, on the ROV if so something goes wrong with it. Then on the next one, that's the standard equipment, yeah. So we're looking just at yeah, more specific measurements uh, on it. Uh, this is for the TMS. Uh, so it's the measurements for the, the TMS on it. And the TMS weighs 580 kilograms in air. So it's quite a lot more weight than, than the 70 kilograms of the ROV itself. Um, yeah, tether length up to 400 meters uh, of tether. So it can, and it can move for the ROV can move 400 meters away from, from the TMS once it's been lowered down. Uh, cameras and lights, it has actually a Menko uh, camera. Uh, it's been used, several Menko cameras that's been used. So the it has the capacity of having four cameras and it has one extra channel that can be used. Uh, and it has a color camera and a low light navigation camera. So that's a, that's a camera that is, um, it's tuned more like the, the eyes of a cat, basically, so that you, re you really don't need much light to be able to see uh, in it. Uh, so it's a, a human eyes wouldn't be able to see in such low light, but when you're getting it up on the screen, it's sort of um, uh, magnifying the light, of course, so that you can see it better. Yeah. It's the thickness of the uh, tether. Uh, so basically, if you, if you for some reason need to use a thicker tether, uh, then you're not going to be able to have 400 meters because when you are spooling it in, uh, if you have a thicker uh, cable, uh, it will take more room. And you can only have so much room in your, in your uh, drum when you're spooling it in. So, so that if, if the cable is thicker than 60 millimeters, you will have less length available. Uh, but since they're putting it in at 60 millimeter tether, uh, th that's the uh, that's the standard that it's being delivered with. <coughs> and uh, it has some uh, halogen lights and some LED lights uh, to be used with it. Um, yeah, some more instrumentation on the side here. It has some depth gauges, gyro and accelerometer, telemetry stuff. It's uh, yeah, it's good information if you are looking to buy <laughs> the ROV. <laughs> so, so this is good information to know. But this is more just to go through and looking at what's the kind of information that you're going to be presented with when you're working with ROVs, because it might not be that you're directly working with the ROV, but it might be that you're designing something that the ROV is going to install, and then you're most likely going to be told that. Uh, well, it's a, a uh, this ROV from uh, from uh, Deep Ocean is going to do it. So a constructor, a work class ROV is going to do this stuff, and especially if you need to utilize the hydraulics package that it has with it, if if the equipment that you are uh, designing that's going to be installed uh, needs to be interfaced into into the hydraulics here and be run by the hydraulics on this one, it is very nice to know. Well, at least. What's the hydraulic system? How much uh, flow can I get from the system? What's the pressure I can get? How many ports do I have available to connect to? All of that uh, stuff. Uh, what are the uh, valve options for, for control uh, when I'm going to use it? So stuff like that is very uh, nice to, to get to know. <coughs> so this one has uh, different key datas. So we get dimensions of its weight. As you can see, it's almost four and a half ton. So that's uh, quite a load, but that's including the payload. So, so that's if it's actually carrying equipment. So that's the maximum weight you can get on it. So 150 horsepower, that's more than uh, the engine in my Volvo. So that's uh, quite a lot of uh, power you can get from it. And it ha can have mm, 600 kilograms of payload. So that means that we are at uh, 3,800 kilograms. In uh, in just sheer force of the of the uh, ROV. Uh, 
and through frame lift capacity, so, so it can actually lift uh, three tons when it's uh, when it's uh, being being uh, lifted. Then, so, so the framework of it has has quite a lot. Uh, it can go down to three thousand uh, meters of seawater, and there is some free space inside the framework here where you can actually put in some. So you have five hundred and twenty by five hundred and twenty millimeters which is going through the entire ROV and right in front of the center of gravity. So it means that you can actually put sensitive equipment and you can hide it inside the ROV and then the ROV can pull it out to, uh, to, uh, to install it later on if it's needed. And a hydraulic supply for tooling. Uh, so you have uh, one pilot controlled outlet on the main pump, which can deliver 250 liters per minute at 200 bars. So uh, that's, uh, that's a very nice uh, system to use. And then you also have an auxiliary system on at 105 liters per minute and 210 bars. Uh, and you are able to have one connection with full flow and uh, four connections with proportional flow. So that means they have proportional valves controlling those with 80 liters per minute as the maximum. Or you can have 20 connections to uh, the proportional flow and then get eight liters per minute uh, on each of them. So, so you can have quite a lot of different connections on it. So it depends a bit on what kind of equipment you're, you're putting in. Uh, do, you, do you need a lot of flow through one port or you do you need to have many ports uh, connected? And in the electrical stuff, you have uh, 13 uh, connectors. Uh, and as you can see, they're called survey connectors. So that's if, if you're just going to place survey equipment on this work ROV and run a pipeline survey for a short length of pipeline, for example. So if, if you don't have any specialized survey ROVs available and you have a certain amount of pipeline that needs to be surveyed right away, uh, then you can just put, uh, put the sensors on this one. So you have uh, the possibility of connecting 13 sensors to it, and then you can uh, run uh, run a survey with this one. Uh, yeah, and then we have that uh, web page. I'm just going into this web page before we finish off for today, just to show a little bit. So this is uh, just the science web page that they're in, and we usually use uh, just design as uh, as our uh, model w when we're doing this be because it's a local company, so we want to promote them, of course. Uh, but you have other large ones. We have FMC, uh, Schilling Robotics. Uh, they also create uh, a lot of ROVs, and you have many ROV companies around the world doing stuff. And like, if you want to look at ROVs, usually you go to the web page of of uh, the um, ROV supplier, and then you can uh, open up their ROV systems. So if we look at maybe we want to look at a survey ROV instead of the constructor. Then we can see what they have here, different kinds of uh, survey ROVs. They didn't have any technical specifications available on that one. So we'll go on, a, uh, on the constructor instead. So you can see we have technical specifications over on the side here. Just, uh, that's just a, a quick summary of, of uh, the most, uh, most important stuff from it. But then you also have different kinds of data sheets that you can download uh, as PDFs and get, get, the, uh, get the full information on it. So that's a very, uh, very usual way of doing it so that you will get, just be told who is supplying the ROV and what kind of ROV is it, and then you yourself have to go in and try to figure out the, the stuff that you need to know. So then we'll, uh, we'll uh, stop for today and we'll continue next week.